Uh, Norman, I appreciate you coming here today to give us this interview for our historical DVD. Can you tell me uh, how you got interested in dental implants? In my second year in dental school, um, our professor of anatomy, whose name was Earl O. Butcher, asked me what my interest might be. And I said, I've got this crazy idea after having visited Sweden for about 10 days on my honeymoon uh, that um, we can do implants here in the United States. And Dr. Butcher said, has that ever been done? I said, I don't think so. But my guess is that we ought to start with some kind of an experimental animal. Dr. Gershkoff uh, graduated from Tufts, and he and his partner practiced in Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, all the world knew Aaron Gershkoff. Kind, congenial, always willing to teach and to give with an open heart. So when you were in dental school, you decided to continue with that. You were starting to talk about the animals, and we're going to get you animals. Well, being a dog lover and always having had two or three or sometimes even four dogs, I would never have done it again. But the standard in research at the time was to use certified beagle dogs. And uh, we had 11 in dental school, 33 at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York where I spent five years, and then uh, when I moved to a hospital in Brooklyn called Brookdale, we actually had 65. But we changed at that time to mongrels, and uh, we did a lot of mandibular implants because in the upper jaw, which is called the maxilla, there's no room to do implants. And so we did implants in the mandible, and uh, we did salivary gland research in those dogs as well, which is not related, so I won't go into some of those what complicated. What implants were you working with at that time? Uh, blade implants, which uh, in our office, I practiced with my father for many years, who was a Columbia graduate. And we had a large laboratory in the basement of this building in Brooklyn, and uh, our laboratory technician used to actually cast them. Or if there was stainless steel, he would machine them. Did you come up with this design yourself, or had you seen the design and modified it from someone else? There was nothing on record. Okay. And uh, my interest in the tissue response uh, was my curiosity was aroused, and so I uh, was invited uh, to lecture at a, uh, an institution in Indiana, in Terre Haute, Indiana, called the Rose Holman Institute of Technology. And we used to go there at the end of May because that was the time of the Indianapolis 500. And the president, um, invited me to lecture and to submit all of the work I had done because I was editor-in-chief of the Journal of Biomedical Materials Research and uh, I was awarded the degree of Doctor of Biomedical Engineering at Rose Holman. And in fact, when my wife, who is sitting to your left, and I leave, we're going to try and find Sam Hulbert, who lives in Florida. And uh, my father and I practiced together from 1954 until 1982 when, uh, because he had a horseshoe kidney, uh, he had some problems with it, and he retired. And in 1982, he was 92, and he practiced to the day that he retired. And three years later, because of complications, he died. 
And uh, I was doing five procedures in the operating room, and he had a private room on the same floor. And I would come rushing in to see him. And after the third procedure, uh, uh, one of the doctors said, your father drew his last breath. And everyone who comes to my house and looks at pictures of him is overwhelmed by his kindness. And he loved my wife. And he loved my family, and he has been, and has, oh, and always will be an inspiration to me. Let me ask you this: When you once you would, what were the results of your uh, dog studies with the with the blades? Well, none of them really succeeded, uh, irrespective of the materials, uh, because of the fact that it's just an intrinsically bad design. Uh, now I heard words like osseointegration. There is no such thing as osseointegration because using an electron microscope, bone cannot unite directly with anything, including ceramic. And in the lectures I give, I demonstrate this using electron microscopy. There will always be, irrespective of how small the space is, so small that the human eye can't see it, so small that it's 10,000 10, times thinner than a piece of newspaper. But nonetheless, it is, in biology, a space. And so, although people talk about surface texture, talk about polished necks, these are all extremely important in extending the longevity, longevity of implants, nonetheless, osseointegration is only a word. And as a matter of fact, my mother, my wife, my eldest son have implants that I have done 30 and more years ago that are still functioning, subperiosteals and endosteal. And uh, I'm delighted that they are successful, but I have a full understanding that there is no significant assurance that implants will always work. Yes. How did you get involved with the AAID? Or what, 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 how, how, what, how did the AAID interest you in becoming a member? Well, before the American Academy of Implant Dentistry was ever even a speck in anyone's mind, um, 11 people met um, in a hotel on Lakeshore Drive in Chicago. And uh, among them was a man named Frank Strake from St. Louis, Missouri, who I'm sure is long dead. And um, Arthur C. Germain, Jr., from Rochester, New York. And we all met, and we had to bring evidence that we had done something. And I don't even remember if there was a president or, I do remember, the president was Isaiah Liu, L-E-W. What year was this? Uh, 1956 or 57. about six years after I finished my residency. And um, uh, the uh, exam was rigorous. Uh, you had to bring, there weren't MRIs at that time, but you had to bring x-rays, clinical photographs. And um, I was the only one of the 11 who did not bring evidence that I had done it for a human. So I brought all my dog studies, and they deliberated while I was out of the room for a long time, but found that what I presented was satisfactory to them. 